discussion led by Sukhiv and Naimi. Um, great, so let's have our first talk. Welcome, Tamir Basam. Hi. So uh, thank you very much for the invitation. And I, I want to talk about some work that I did in the past decade with these three awesome uh, PhD students of mine at the time. So uh, the, we were interested in systems of equations of this form, so fixed point equations, uh, where these things, these, these uh, functions are polynomials. And these are equations over some omega continuous semi-ring. So thanks to Erich, uh, I don't have to tell you very much about what omega continuity is. Just a reminder, it means this relation, which is defined in this way, the natural order is a partial order. And uh, essentially continuity means that these chains over this order have limits, infinite chains have limits. The limit is well defined. And, so on. and uh, Erich gave you hundreds of examples, but there is one which he didn't mention or he mentioned only indirectly, which is going to be relevant for this uh, talk, so it's the language semi-ring, where the elements of the semi-ring are languages, uh, plus is union, and uh, uh, product is concatenation. Okay, so excuse me, language uh, uh, generated by regular expression or something? No, it's just, an, uh, just languages. So you, you fix an alphabet, and the elements of the semi-ring are languages over the alphabet. In principle, arbitrary. And then in the rest of this talk, I will just talk about semi-rings, but I always mean this, right? Good. Uh, no. So what is the goal of, of this research program, if you want, that, that we did? Uh, it was develop generic solution or approximation methods, right? Which are valid not just for one semi-ring, but for uh, multiple semi-rings. And, and of course, the, the, the paradigmatic example of a method which works uh, for an arbitrary semi-ring is uh, clinic, linear iteration. So, so you have a system of fixed points equations over a semi-ring, then there always exists a least solution, a least fixed point with respect to the natural order. And that solution is the limit of the sequence zero, f of zero, f of f of zero, and so on, okay? So this gives you a way, an algorithm for calculating, approximating the fixed point, which is to compute these approximants and stop either when you see that one approximant is equal to the previous one, then you can stop and you have the exact result, or when you think that the approximation is good enough. Good, so I would like to start by re uh, recalling a couple of uh, important facts about the left linear case. So where, where these polynomials are just uh, 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 linear polynomials and uh, the coefficients are on the left, so notice that this is important here because I haven't told you that the semi-ring is commutative, right? Well, most examples will be commutative, but uh, it makes a difference. So if you have a, a, a semi-ring which is not commutative and you have also uh, coefficients on the right, then things become much more complicated. But uh, for the left linear case, so uh, first thing is what happens when you work over the reals? And I am waving my hands a little bit essentially right here but basically, linear iteration is going to have linear convergence, which I like to define. I like to define it in this way. Linear convergence, what, what means is k iterations will give you theta of k uh, accurate bits, okay? So this means in particular, if you double the number of iterations, you will double the number of uh, uh, accurate uh, bits. And then something also important is that for left linear systems, you have Gauss elimination where you define the star of a semi-ring element like this, right? Is the, and this is defined because we have an omega continuous semi-ring. And then Arden's lemma tells you how to solve, solve in quotes, right? Uh, linear equations of this form tells you that the least solution of an equation like this is A star B. Good, and then this immediately gives you an, an, an algorithm for solving systems of linear equations, assuming that you know how to compute the A star, right? Uh, which is, uh, uh, you know, you pick any equation, you rewrite it like this, but yes, using distributivity, you know, and uh, so this is, this is going to be now a term which may contain other variables, you know, but uh, formally this is going to give you, you replace in all other equations the uh, variable xi by this term. And this gives you, in particular, when you apply it to the language semi-ring, this is nothing but a well-known method of computing a regular expression for uh, uh, an automaton, the final Good. So uh, Gauss elimination, you know, reduces, uh, you, you should see it like this, reduces solving a system 
a little of left linear equations to compute in AS star. So if you know how to do this, then you know how to compute the solution. Okay. Now in the uh, over the reals, this is the the the, uh, the 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 case where everything works wonderfully, right? Because AS star is going to be either zero if A is equal to zero, is going to be one divided by one minus A if A is between zero and one, because A star is you know you can uh, is the sum of a geometric series. And it's going to be infinity if A is bigger than or equal to 1. So you have a very uh, good way of computing stars. But, you know, uh, something that I like to, 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 to mention is what happens in the language semi-ring. In the language semi-ring, we do not compute A star. We just take A star as the representation of the language, right? And the point is that it's good enough. Because in the end, you do not want to compute Actually, all you can do is to compute some representation of the solution, which is good enough for your purposes. What does it mean good enough for your purposes? Usually what you want to do is query some aspects about the solution, ask questions about the solution. And in the case of the language semi-ring, what you can do, for example, is once you have the, 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 the regular expression, if somebody asks you whether a word belongs to that regular expression, you can we know how to do that with the help of finite automata, or you can even answer more complicated queries. Okay, so actually, it's not even clear what it means to solve an equation. It's not. Uh, it, it's not. Uh, you don't always have a canonical representation, which is the one that you obviously should uh, should obtain. Okay, once uh, that is in place, uh, we were interested in the nonlinear case. Okay, and in the nonlinear case, the first thing you observe is that Klinney iteration is a miserable. Uh, technique because it gives you logarithmic convergence only in the worst case. Okay, so the number of accurate bits is going to be uh, to grow like the logarithmic that the log like the logarithm of the number of iterations. And it happens even for this trivial uh, equation. You can see that the least fixed point is one. Okay, but uh, if you apply two thousand iterations, for example, of, of uh, clean iterations, you will only have three accurate bits. Sorry, not bits, but, but digits. So um, uh, that's a that's a problem, and the second problem is that you know also you don't have no reduction for in the linear or you have no reduction in the nonlinear case to compute in stars, right? Or at least no no obvious one. Good. Okay. So what can a numerical mathematician do about this? They will tell you, well, of course you would never apply linear iteration here, and they would tell you you would do you would apply Newton's method. Okay. So uh, what is Newton's method? And before, let's recall it, but uh, before let's give a graphical interpretation of linear iteration. So imagine that we want to solve um, the equation, this equation, right? And now uh, what happens is that we take here, the, this is the straight line y is equal to x, this is the curve y is equal to f of x, and the least fixed point, well, you take the point where these two lines intersect, and uh, this is going to be the fixed, uh, least fixed point. In this case, it's equals to one, right? <laughs> and then, what uh, graphically, what does it mean to apply uh, Klinney iteration? You start by computing f of zero, and then you want to compute f of f of zero. So you reflect this on the axis. You have to imagine that this is forty-five degrees, which is not, but uh, do it in your head, right? So then, uh, this is going to be f of f of zero, right? And then you iterate, right? You, can, you compute uh, f of f of zero and so on, and you reach, uh, uh, you approximate the fixed point in this way. Good. So, what do you do in Newton's method? In Newton's method, for this, Newton's method is actually defined for arbitrary equations of the form f of x is equal to zero. But of course, x is equal to f of x is a particular case. You just put x on the other side. And when you interpret Newton's method for this kind of equation, what you are going to obtain is the following. You start by computing f of zero, but now what you do is you compute the best linear approximation of this curve at this point, which is just the derivative, okay? You compute the slope of the, of the straight line, which is the derivative, and then instead of intersecting the blue line which, with the black line, which is difficult, you intersect the red line with the black line, which is easy. Because you are intersecting just two straight lines, right? And then at that point, you compute the value of the function. Good. And now you do the same. You compute the best linear approximation to the curve. You compute the intersection. And then you compute the value again, and so on. 
And even visually, you can see that this goes faster, right? What are the assumptions and effort? Sorry? What are the assumptions and effort is to add differentiable? What? Yeah, differentiable. Yeah, basically differentiable. Uh, that's right. OK. Sorry? Uh, well, not in the particular case we have now. I mean, uh, over semi rings, everything is monotone, right? Uh, in general, it also works for non monotonic uh, 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 functions, but the problem is that what you see here in the slide, right? The problem is that, well, Newton's method is usually very efficient. In practice, you see often exponential convergence. That's the reason why, for example, when you want to compute the square root numerically, you always use Newton's method because it's going to have this behavior. It's going, the number of accurate bits is going to double with each iteration, right? But the problem is, in general, you are, you are not applying it only to monotone functions and so on. In general, it's not robust. It may not converge. It may converge only locally in some neighborhood of, of the least fixed point, which you have to guess. You have to guess a point which is close enough to the least fixed point so that you converge there, or it's going to converge uh, very slowly. OK? So uh, uh, the problem is then that when we started, or, or if you want, when we started this, this program, uh, what we had is this frustrating mismatch, right? Uh, Clinia iteration is very robust. You can apply it to every semi-ring, but uh, it's going to converge slowly, in particular, over the reals, right? And Newton's method may converge very fast, but it's not robust. And it can only be applied to the reals. It wasn't clear how do you apply it to an arbitrary semi-ring. OK, good. So these are the two main results of this program. First, Newton's method can be generalized to arbitrary semi-ring. And for this particular case, it becomes just as robust as Clini's method. So it's always going to converge. And uh, uh, you will not have these, these problems with local convergence. There is always global convergence. Converges starting from zero and so on. OK, and the second result is that over the reals, right, Newton's method converges at least linearly and often exponentially. So it's at least as good as, as uh, 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 linear iteration in the linear case, but, you know, but it converges exponentially uh, often over the real semi-ring and never worse than linearly. And I must say this was uh, done, uh, the, we did some work on this. We, we had some contribution there, but this is mostly work done by Etesami Stewart and Janakakis in a series, in a series of papers. Good. So uh, how do you, uh, and I'm going to, here I'm going to talk mostly about this, uh, or actually almost only about this, I would say. But so how do you generalize Newton's method? OK, so we are going to use this derivation tree analysis uh, idea that Matthias already uh, introduced yesterday. So uh, and the first idea is that, you know, trivially an equation, Let's think of one single equation, but this generalizes without any problem to a system of equations, right? Uh, an equation over a semi-ring induces a context-free grammar. And, uh, you know, the context-free grammar induced by this equation is just this thing here. Okay, so you consider these uh, uh, things here, these numbers, as elements of the semi-ring, abstract elements of the semi-ring. Back to polynomials now, so assuming f is a polynomial now. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So I say, yeah. So, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, over semi-rings, everything is a polynomial, right? How do you define it? other things? And you need, you need an additional structure you need in order to introduce something different. Okay, and uh, so this will be the context-free grammar associated to this equation, yeah? And if you have a system of equations, then you associate it uh, context-free grammar with multiple values. Yeah, in the next slides, we're going to consider this running example because it's, it already contains all the important elements. So A, B, and C, think of them as semi-ring elements, uh, arbitrary, so there's over some semi-ring. And then we have this equation, and this is the associated context-free grammar. Okay. Good. So now, uh, given a grammar, uh, uh, a grammar has, in a grammar, you can have derivation trees, right? You can derive words uh, by applying the productions of the grammar. So what we do is we assign to a derivation tree the yield of the tree, and the yield is defined as the order, because it, the, the semi-ring could be non-commutative, uh, uh, non right? Order product of the leaves of the tree, right? So for example, the, the, um, the yield of this tree is C, 
the yield of this derivation tree of the grammar is a times c times c, and here you have a times c times b times c. And then the yield of a set of trees is the sum in the semi-ring of the yields of all trees, right? So the yield of this set of three trees is going to be this semi-ring. Good. So now you have this fundamental proposition, which is not really difficult to prove. So let D be the set of all derivations trees of G. Then the idea is the least fixed point is the yield of the complete set of derivation trees. OK, so given an equation, you have a least fixed point. But you can also go from the equation to the grammar. From the grammar, you can go to the set of derivation trees. And you go to the yield. And then these two things are equal. OK? Good. So now then something that you can start thinking about is, well, when I consider an approximation method, I can try to look at this method as capturing the yield of more and more trees. OK? And the question is, which are the trees that the approximation may, uh, measure uh, method is capturing? So in the case of cleaning approximation, it's again also very easy to show that it amounts to capturing trees according to uh, actually height. I should put height here, sorry. According to height, OK? So the idea is that the first uh, cleaning approximant will be the uh, yield of all trees of height 1, and then height 2, and then height 3. At, at, I should say at most 1, at most 2, at most 3, and so on, right? There was a question here. Yeah, so the yield of a set is the sum of the yield? Yeah, exactly. So you use product to compute the yield of a tree, and you use sum to compute the yield of a set. Yeah. Sorry if I missed this, but this is we are in the univariate case, right? Uh, no. No, uh, it's going to be, OK, so if you want that, it will be a bit more complicated. So imagine that you have multiple equations here. Then what you will do is in order to obtain the component of the fixed point or the, compo or the, the, the component of the approximation corresponding to the variable <laughs> xi, you will consider only the trees with xi at the root. Um, OK. So when you consider the derivation trees, if I don't tell you which is the axiom of the grammar, these grammars do not have an axiom, right? Actually, what you have is for each variable its own set of derivations. Variable per variable, you can. You, you, you do variable per variable. OK, other questions? No? Good. OK, so this is uh, 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 the characterization of the Clini approximants. And now the question is, what is the characterization of the Newton approximants? And this is our fundamental theory. Our fundamental theorem is the ith Newton approximant is the yield of all derivation trees of a Strahler number at most i. So instead of capturing trees by height, you capture trees by a Strahler number. And probably you are all asking yourself, what the hell is the Strahler number of a tree, right? Good. Um, Strahler is Arthur N. Strahler, who in 1952 published this paper. And he wasn't a computer scientist. He wasn't a mathematician. He was a geographer or a geologist. And the definition of the Strahler number is in this paper, right? <laughs> Very fitting for our workshop. So the problem that the Strahler had was, you know, in the early 50s, you started to have aerial uh, pictures of, 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 of uh, things like this, like a system of rivers. And now the question you have is, what if I give you a picture like this and I ask you, which is the main river? Well, uh, now is here is very easy because I have drawn it thicker for you, right? <laughs> but imagine that all these segments would be equally thick. Then you have to decide in some way. And which is the algorithmic way in which you can decide which is the main river? So Strahler proposed, made a proposal. And uh, what he said is, well, let's assign to each segment in this picture a number. And the idea is the fingertip segments, so you know the ones where you have you know, a source, you give them, you assign them number one, OK? And then the rule is the following. When two streams, first order streams, you know, uh, join, then the resulting stream is going to have the Strahler number two, <coughs> OK? And then if two streams of order two join, then the resulting uh, stream will have a Strahler number three, and so on. OK, so for example, here uh, you have uh, one stream of order two and another stream of order two. And then the resulting stream is of order three, it's black. And here two black streams 
get into a green stream of order four. Yeah. It's max of the two plus one. Uh, Wait a second, because they, uh, uh, max of the two plus one, uh, no, because here what you have is, um, if you have you have here a stream of order three, which uh, joins a street or is joined by a stream of order two, and then the result is order three. You do not change the order. Okay. So, yeah. Uh, so for identifying like continuous or continuous segment, segments of streams, like we have, uh, these dark seconds are all threes. Are we establishing what is considered a three by looking at where you have the same Strahler numbers next to each other? Like, how do you decide that, say, the stream coming off of those twos that you identified before is still the same three segment the whole way? So you mean how I, they, I do I identify that this one, this segment, is the same as this one? Um, has the same color as this one, or I don't know. Yeah. Well, you know, in this a, a, a segment here is color black if it has uh, a Strahler number three, right? So here this segment has a Strahler number three. This segment has a Strahler number two, right? And then this segment has a Strahler number three. Okay. Good. So the colors are just remembering. The, the, sorry, the colors just tell you which are the. I have colored the segments according to their Strahler number. <laughs> Now, if you want to, and what the Strahler was saying is then, well, if you want to know which is the main stream, then start at four and then decrease only when you don't have any choice, right? So here you go here and then here you have to uh, decrease. Well, when you have to decrease because two, jo two streams of, of uh, um, Strahler number three join, then you can take any of the two. And he, had, he gave additional instructions on how to um, uh, choose which one, but we don't care about those because they are not topological, they are metric, right? But here at this point, you, could, you don't have to decrease. You could take, if you take this one, you decrease, but you don't have to. So then you continue with three, okay? And you continue with three until you have no choice, which it happens here, right? And then that gives you one possible mainstream. Yeah. So that I understand, we could also go on left and then we would go. Here we could also have gone left. Okay, good. Uh, yeah, by the way, this is a real German river, the Elbe River. <laughs> okay, so now mathematically, this is the definition. We prefer to start counting at zero, but the idea is that what is the Strahler number of a tree? Well, you define it inductively. The Strahler number of uh, a tree with just one node is zero. Okay, and now what happens? Uh, how do you decide the Strahler number of a node in the tree? Well, you look at these uh, uh, children, and you look at the Strahler number of the children, and you take the maximum of those. If you see the maximum here among the children exactly once, right, then you, you keep the Strahler number. If you see the maximum at least twice, then you increase by one. Okay? So that's the... That's the inductive uh, definition. Uh, so another way of looking at it is a tree has a Strahler number k bigger than zero if it consists of a spine, right? Which uh, such that all the subtrees which do not belong to the spine have a Strahler number at most k minus one. And the spine ends at some point where at least two children have a uh, a Strahler number exactly k minus one. Characterizations, uh, oh, sorry, this is a mistake. Right. Characterizations, for example, the Strahler number of a tree is the height of the largest minor, that is a full binary tree, okay, that you can embed in the, in the tree. Or for example, if you like a more operational view, imagine that you have an uh, arithmetic expression like this, and you have to evaluate it, right? The Strahler number is the minimal, the, the minimal number of registers that you need in order to evaluate it. Okay, because depending, the number of registers depends on the order of evaluation. If you take the optimal order, then that's the Strahler number. Okay, good. So now that we have this uh, theorem, which I'm not going to prove, it's a bit more complicated, right? Then how can we use it to compute? So uh, the idea is uh, let's let's keep our uh, let's take our running example right, and uh, the idea is simple. So let's or, or the first idea is simple. Let's try to unfold this grammar G 
into grammars G0, G1, G2, and so on, so that the derivation trees of the kth grammar contains only the trees of G of a stellar number at most k. Okay? How to do that is not very complicated. So uh, here you have um, uh, how to do it for this particular example. So how do you compute G0? So G0 is, uh, should have, is a grammar which should produce only the, the trees of, of uh, stellar number 0. Okay? And then, well, the only one that you have there is C. More generally, in order to do it systematically, well, it's, uh, let's introduce these two variables, right? Xk, but with the, um, how do you call this? Uh, with a bracket, right? I guess so. Yeah. This generates the trees of a stellar number exactly k, or is going, we are going to design the grammar in such a way, right? And this one, with the square parenthesis, they generate the trees of a stellar number less than or equal to k. And the only thing which is important here, don't, don't read all this mambo jumbo. The only thing which is important here is this equation or this, this uh, set of productions. Because this is going, this corresponds exactly to the um, inductive definition of a Strahler number. What this is telling you is the following. I want, this should, this, this should produce trees of a Strahler number exactly K, right? So then, how can such a tree, a tree of a Strahler number exactly k look like? Well, it could start with this production, right? And then what happens if it starts with that production? The tree looks like this. But then there are three possibilities. One possibility is these two subtrees, both of them have a Strahler number exactly k minus one. Because then you have to go one up. This corresponds to this term, okay? Or this one generates a, a, a tree of a stellar number exactly k, and this one generates a tree of a stellar number smaller than k, at most uh, k minus one. This corresponds to this term, okay? You need also the other term because it could be the other way around. And, uh, what, uh, and that accounts for what can happen with this, uh, with this production. Now, what can happen with this production? Then the tree is going to look like this. Okay, and now here you must have a tree of a stellar number exactly k, otherwise you don't get the stellar number, uh, a tree of a stellar number k here. Okay, so that's why you have this. Tree. Good, so it's very easy then to produce, to unfold the grammar in this way inductively, right? <coughs> and the crucial observation, uh, well, and then, of, since, since, sorry, and since you have this now, how, do you can, how can you generate the uh, semi-ring values or the yields, you know, of uh, the trees of a stellar number equal to k or less than or equal to k? You just substitute here uh, the, uh, uh, the, the bars in the, in the grammar by plus, right? And, and the uh, concatenation by product. Good. Now the problem is how do you solve these equations, right? Iteratively. Well, the important observation is that this equation, which is the crucial one, right? This equation is always linear in, in the variable. So what happens then is that Newton's method, what Newton's method is telling you is that you can approximate the solution of nonlinear equations assuming that you can solve or at least approximate linear equations. So it does not do the whole thing for you. You still have to come up with a way of solving linear equations, right? And then Newton's method will tell you how to approximate general equations. And now you can see also the correspondence to the geometric intuition. Remember what we were doing? We were replacing the nonlinear equation by the best approximation. That was the derivative, right? And then, we were saying, okay, instead of computing the intersection of the curve with the line, with the straight line, we compute the intersection of the two lines. We assume that we know how to compute the intersection of the two lines. If we know how to do that, we can then solve the general problem. Good. So, for example, in, uh, take now our example uh, and imagine that 
or let's consider this equation. And now imagine that the semi-ring is commutative. If the semi-ring is commutative, then uh, you can reverse the order here. And then what you have is that x with uh, bracket k is equal to this linear equation. Okay, so it is, it is uh, notice that we, can, we assume now that we have recursively computed this term and this term. And now what we have is a linear equation on xk, and then uh, you can apply Arden's lemma. Okay, so then in this way you obtain the, uh, the approximate, I mean, the, the solution for xk here. So in particular, if you are over the language semi-ring, the, what you are doing is approximating a context-free language by regular languages. Question? Yeah. Uh, so you calculate x uh, angle brackets k minus one uh, by the, from the previous iteration. Right. Uh, so how do you calculate uh, square brackets? Yeah, well, the square brackets, yeah, that's a good question, and I should have uh, said it. It's very simple. So a square brackets means uh, trees, the yield of trees of uh, uh, Stroller number at most k. So then these are the. Sorry? Square means exactly or? Square means at most, okay. and bracket uh, and angle brackets means exactly. I, I see, I see. Okay, so this is then uh, this, right? You just accumulate. Okay. You just accumulate. Thank you. Okay. Other, other questions? No. So in particular, now you know uh, what it means to approximate uh, context-free language using Newton's method. Okay. I think I missed something very basic at the start. What do you mean by approximating the language? How do you define the approximation of the language? You'll get a language and compared to the context-free language, the two are close? Or? No, what you just are computing is larger and larger subsets of the language. And you know that uh, the, in the limit, you will have uh, all the words in the language. So there, there will, for every word in the language, there is going to be an approximation which contains it. But is, is there a notion similar to the bits of accuracy that we had in case of reals? I mean, you have to, you would have to define that, right? So, for example, you can start defining. In, in general, no, right? Because you don't have a metric. But what you can do, for example, is imagine that you have a probabilistic context-free grammar. In fact, this gives you a method. By which, I mean, you, you can compute, actually, using this technique, you can compute the Newton approximant. It's going to give you a regular language together with the probability of that language, right? So you know that, the, in general, the probability of generating a word is going to be one. And then you can say, well, you know, if you take the fourth Newton approximation, you have this regular language, and you know that the probability of generating one word in this language is 97%. Okay. okay, so then you can say, oh, this is good enough for me. I don't care about the rest. I will take this as a good approximation of the... And the convergence here is exponential. And... The convergence is going to be at least linear in the number of iterations, and uh, very often is going to be exponential. So actually what this is telling you is that if you take, you give me any, any uh, uh, probabilistic uh, context-free grammar, and essentially, it is, I can tell you, it will be very, with the, the probability of generating something of highest Strahler number is very low. To be precise, the probability of generating a word such that the, you can only generate it with trees of a Strahler number, uh, of this Strahler number is very low because, you know, a word could have different derivation trees, right? Good, so now, uh, I don't have much time, right? I, I, how much time do you have? 12 minutes. Sorry? 12 minutes. 12. Oh, wow. <laughs> oh, then, then I can tell you a little bit. Uh, uh, that's, that's great. Uh, 12 minutes is great. I was thinking on four or something. <laughs> Good. OK, because then the rest of the stuff is going to be, uh, well, a couple of applications, uh, in quotes, applications, right? Depending on what your, your, your take on, on how applied this is. So uh, the first thing is that, uh, well, you can use this to prove that Newton's method terminates for, uh, in particular, this class of uh, semi-rings. Newton's method terminates over idempotent and commutative semi-rings. What this means is that there is a fixed number of iterations such that after that number of iterations, you know that you already have reached the fixed point, okay? And which is the class of semi-rings? 
Well, uh, well, as you see first, uh, if, if you have n polynomial equations, then you are going to finish after n plus one iterations. And which is the class of semi-rings? These are idempotent and commutative semi-rings, right? So this means plus is idempotent and a product is commutative. Now, uh, how do you interpret this from the point of view of the derivation trees? Remember, the yield of a tree is the product of the leaves and the yield of a set of trees is the sum. Okay, of the of the yields of the trees. So plus being idempotent means that you don't care about how many copies you have of a tree or of a word. Okay, you only worry about the possible yields and no, and not about their multiplicity. Okay, and uh, commutative means that you don't care about the order in the leaves. Right, you only care about how many times you have each letter in the yield. Good. So then what you can do in order to prove this result, all you have to do is this. Prove that for every derivation tree, yeah. What, what is idempotent? I'm sorry. Idempotent means that uh, a plus a is a, right? Oh, okay. okay. Good. So now uh, all you have to prove is that for every derivation tree in the grammar, there is going to be a derivation tree which produces not necessarily the same word, but a commutative, uh, sorry, a, a, a permutation of that word, right? And with a small Strahler number. And you can prove that, okay? You can prove that for every word, there is always a, a, a Strahler, a, a tree of a Strahler number at most n plus one, which is going to generate not necessarily the same word, but a um, permutation of that. Comment on the connection to Parik theorem, I maybe mean, Dexter Cousins um, generalization. Yes, I can. <laughs> Thank you for the. Yes, and in fact, a consequence of this is a constructive, uh, um, a constructive proof of Parik's theorem. So Parik's theorem tells you for every context-free language, there is a regular language with the same commutative image. Okay, and um, uh, using this technique we can, you can derive a, uh, a, an algorithm that generates actually a, uh, a, um, uh, an automaton for, the, uh, for this uh, regular language. Yeah. What sense about what happens if you don't have the idempotency assumption? Uh, well, I can say that things get more complicated, <laughs> but what, do you, what would you expect or what do you... I mean, does it... Converge or converge more slowly? Does it is it unknown? Does it possibly not converge? Those there are so okay. So f first of all, the problem is one, there is one fundamental problem. What does it mean to converge fast? In an arbitrary semi-ring, uh, you don't have a uh, there is not no generic way of defining that, right? You can only define that when you have some kind of metric that tells you how far are you from some point, right? Yeah, well, then, for example, in the case that you are mentioning, there are things that you can do by saying that, okay, if you compute up to this number, if you compute uh, uh, this, this Newton approximant, then if you have captured this tree, then you have captured also at least as many copies of the tree. Okay, there are results about uh, like those. The question is whether uh, they are good enough for you to do something or not, right? That depends on... Uh, what you want to do. Yeah. Was there any attempt to, to substitute for this some kind of Cauchy condition that the, so, so you do have natural order, so so if uh, a, a n plus one minus a n minus one is in some sense bigger, uh, sorry, smaller than a n minus one. Plus yeah, but what does that mean, right? Does it mean, you, if you count the, if you count the numbers of words, probably, for example, it can be the case that each approximant gives you infinitely many words. Each of them could give you infinitely many new words. We do have examples of semi-rings in which there can be sunny checks. Okay. For example, uh, the tropical or the, you know, where, where those values have an order, even the natural order has, <laughs> has a, a good interpretation that, that connects to our intuition better. Right. So all I can say is we have tried what I said before. 
trying to see, okay, if you, gen if you have generated some tree, how many copies of the tree have you generated? Try to give lower bounds. Uh, no, we haven't looked at Cauchy uh, conditions. That looks interesting. If you have any, because it, you seem to have an intuition of semi-rings where that would make sense. And then that would be great. That would be fantastic, right? Because then that gives you a basis to... Semi-rings of polynomials. There I don't know what sense do they make, but yes. No, but what, I mean, polynomials in, in a semi-ring, everything is a polynomial, right? Well, so you only have plus and times. <laughs> the natural order on polynomials. Ah. Okay, good. Yeah, that that uh, that could be interesting. Okay. Well, one more question. Yeah. Just going back to that identity button. So, if I just have something like a plus a plus n times equal to a, then that convergence extends to that kind of ring. So you said a plus a equal to a, but there might be rings where a plus a plus after n iteration it goes back to a. Yeah, sure. A, 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 so n times a is going to be a. Yeah. Is that theorem uh, gives you some bound? I mean, the previous theorem you said. Well, this is this is yeah. The previous theorem is telling you that you are done after n plus one iterations. You don't have to continue. You have already reached the exact solution. Right, but that's for the idempotent. But this is this. Uh, it is well. It is. You need both idempotence and commutative, uh, right? right? So if I have this. A, idempotent means a plus a equal to a. Yeah. If I have a plus a plus up to n, and then it becomes a. Ah, okay. Sorry, sorry. That's what you mean. You mean replacing idempotence by a plus a may be different from a, but a. Ah, right, 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 right. Yes. Uh, yeah, that so works too. Plus one no, I don't. I don't remember now. Uh, you have to change this. Yes, uh, but I. I have. I must say, I have to check it. Yeah. Uh, sorry. Now I understand what you mean. I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. Good. Uh, I was. Uh, yeah. Okay, uh, then, uh, yeah, so Paddock's theorem. So how do you, uh, so the idea is that now you know that the uh, regular language, which is going to have the same commutative image, is going to be the n plus one approximation, okay? All the approximations are regular languages, and the moment you compute the n plus one, then you know that you already have uh, something which is, whose commutative image is the same as the image of Paddock. And then, uh, Don, you're not going to understand this, but it uh, doesn't matter. I mean, uh, so if you take this context-free grammar, our algorithm will construct you this automaton, right? So I'm not going to tell you how, but this is a constructive version of Parish. Parish theorem tells you this, this uh, um, um, regular language exists. And of course, the proof gives you a construction, but uh, it's not very nice, I must say. I think this is. I, I think this is much nice. Good. Um, and then I would like to finish. How, ma how much time do I have now? Then two minutes. Then I'm going to skip this. If anybody is interested in how to reduce or, or how to design a recommendation system, um, which uh, is able to, you know, capture things like. Uh, 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 membership uh, membership in groups by so where essentially you can define groups recursively where you can do things like this person recommends this group with this weight where you can define the groups also recursively for example I can say I can define the recursively the set of my friends by saying these persons are my friends and then there is a general rule that the friends of my friends are my friends okay and maybe even with a dumping factor where you say well, these persons are my friends. The friends of my friends are also my friends, but not so much my friends as my friends, and so on. All that can be in this can be done with these uh, systems of polynomial equations, and you can use Newton's method in order to compute how, with how much weight, are we all, for example, as a community, recommending a particular person? I may be recommending a person because. I know him, somebody else indirectly because he's a co-author of a friend, and so on, right? Good, so, but I don't have time for that, so uh, ask me about it if you are interested, and then let me go do this, and then go do this. Thank you. Let's take one or two questions, and the main, many questions we have, we keep maybe for the interactive discussion. Paris? So, so your result about convergence has to do with another iteration of Newton's method, but each iteration requires to solve the linear system, which uh, requires to think about also you need to do another iteration to compute the linear system. 
So can you say something about the total number of iterations in, in that sense? Uh, well, okay. For example, or yeah, no, let's, let's see. I mean, so what you are saying is completely right. So you may not have uh, a way, I mean, if you can, if you have a way or if you are happy with, uh, or if you have some way of computing a stars that you are happy with, right? Or if you are happy with leaving the stars as they are, as it would happen with regular languages, right? Then you can, you can solve the linear equations exactly, okay? So if you cannot, then you can always apply linear iteration. I mean, Newton's iteration does not help you at all for linear equations. Then you will have to do linear iteration. And then indeed, well, all you know is that over the reals, right, the linear iteration is going to converge linearly. Okay. I mean, there are some corner cases, but essentially linearly, right? So you can then decide how many iterations you want to do of a clean. The problem is, you know, over the reals, you can solve linear, uh, uh, linear equations exactly, right? So again, you have to go to, a, you have to tell me which is your semi-ring, right? Once you, once, or, or some idea about your semi-ring, and then one can start thinking about how many iterations of clinic would, uh, uh, would be good to do so, so that you can combine them with Newton. Because Newton's method works well also if you have only an approximation of the linear equation, right? You can apply them. You can take that instead of the real solution of the exact solution and apply Newton's method. You can use that to accelerate or to obtain better results. Right? Okay, one more question. Okay. Thank you for this great talk. Uh, do you get any leverage if your semi ring is a semi field? Because I'm thinking you have a new example would be the rational functions in one variable. That's a semi field. And that would somehow help you thinking about the, the difference that allows you to find the derivative and so on. Great question. I don't know. Yes. Okay. And let's take a 15 minute break because we have two more talks and then we're going to have to.